All right, first question. Your last Q&A about supplements that damage the kidneys was eye-opening. Are there any supplements that are bad for the heart? So my point in the previous Q&A was that, you know, whether or not some supplement is bad for your kidneys or any food is bad for your kidneys depends on your kidney markers and your actual kidney health. So uh, it all comes down to how something affects your body. And the way you know that is, you know, Technically, you could also assess it based on your, you know, how you feel. But looking at certain biomarkers is uh, where it's all about. Essentially, when we're talking about kidney health, with heart health, it's a bit more tricky because there's no specific biomarker for heart health, whereas we have it with uh, kidneys. But uh, with heart health, okay, let's talk about the risk of heart disease primarily. So the two supplements that appear to have some evidence and associations with heart disease are iron and uh, calcium. So excess iron intake can be uh, increasing the risk of atherosclerosis, it can increase inflammation, oxidative stress in the body and damage the blood vessels. So excess iron in of itself, like blood iron levels, too high blood iron levels, no matter the source, they are also considered like a risk factor for heart disease. Now the same, ha is, the same applies to low iron levels, low iron levels, anemia, those things are also risk factors for heart disease. So obviously the answer is somewhere in the middle, having normal iron levels. And supplementing iron, if you don't have any reason for that, you know, could increase inflammation and oxidative stress in your body. So I wouldn't say that uh, everyone should be afraid of taking iron supplements, you know, women, if they're suffering from iron deficiency anemia, might benefit from iron supplements. But if you're like a regular guy, or a regular person, then um, it's one of those supplements that you would definitely need to be more careful with. The same applies to calcium. So excess calcium levels in the blood can cause this hypercalcemia, which uh, appears to increase the risk of myocardial infarction, and also atheros not atherosclerosis essentially, but like calcification. So this doesn't apply to dietary calcium, fortunately. So dietary calcium appears to be kind of a more uh, neutral, but uh, excess calcium supplementation, so it causing hypercalcemia in the blood uh, appears to uh, promote that. So again, if you don't have any calcium deficiency, you are consuming calcium from the diet, then it's certainly something that um, or you wouldn't want to necessarily supplement uh, with calcium. If you are postmenopausal woman, or you're on a very low calcium diet, or your blood calcium levels are low, then it's kind of a different scenario. In that kind of, kind of case, uh, it might be uh, okay to do. So monitoring your blood markers, monitoring your iron levels, your calcium levels, uh, they are also kind of handy in this uh, scenario. Now there are certain supplements that also contain calcium, not as a main ingredient, but they can still potentially cause hypercalcemia. One of the first ones is uh, calcium alpha ketoglutarate, which uh, yeah, many people are using as a longevity supplement, but it does contain calcium as well. It says in the name calcium alpha ketoglutarate. You can also use alpha ketoglutarate as arginine alpha ketoglutarate, so that wouldn't have the calcium, but calcium alpha ketoglutarate is one of the more popular versions of AKG and uh, like 1000 milligrams of calcium AKG is something like 400 milligrams of calcium. So yeah, you need to be more careful with that as well. So I'm not a big proponent of taking calcium AKG over the long term all the time. You could swap it out for arginine AKG or uh, something like that, unless you are again on a low calcium uh, diet. The second version or second sup sup supplement that also falls into this category is HMB. So HMB is a supplement that has evidence that it can protect against muscle catabolism and sarcopenia, especially in elderly people. So uh, this is a kind of a useful supplement, but only if you're more at a higher risk of uh, frailty and sarcopenia to prevent excessive muscle loss. And uh, HMB can also be combined with calcium HMB or HMB free acid. So uh, the calcium HMB is kind of <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately more effective than the free acid version. So if you are taking HMB, then the calcium HMB is definitely more potent or more effective. And it's kind of similar that, okay, three, three grams of uh, HMB calcium, is gonna contain something like 400 milligrams of calcium. So you need to be aware of that and um, adjust your dietary calcium intake accordingly, or just monitor your blood calcium levels uh, based on that. So these will be additional calcium examples or calcium supplement examples. I'm sure there might be a few more. Another supplement that might be harmful for the heart uh, is high dose omega-3s. 
and I'm talking specifically about the risk of atrial fibrillation. So I've made a video about it as well in the past, how omega-3s generally have been found to have benefits for cardiovascular disease and reducing the risk of uh, certain uh, like uh, adverse outcomes from cardiovascular disease. But uh, kind of the dose is uh, more important here. Excessive omega-3 intake of over 3 grams a day appears to increase the risk of atrial fibrillation, but it's a higher risk in people who already have some risk of atrial fibrillation or they already have it. So if you're an otherwise healthy person, you don't have heart disease, you're taking 3 grams of omega-3s, then chances are you'll be fine. But again, you know, you need to monitor <laughs> your own um, heart health and uh, pay attention to like atrial fibrillation in this example. So usually 1.5 grams of omega-3s are safe, less than 3 grams, something like 2.5 grams, also appear to be safe. If it goes over 3 grams, then um, that's what the research finds, that it appears to increase the risk of atrial fibrillation slightly, and more specifically in people with already existing atrial fibrillation or already existing heart disease. So it kind of depends on which person are we talking about. Speaking of atrial fibrillation or heart health in general, then excess caffeine could also contribute to that. Now, it's very hard to consume too much caffeine if you're drinking coffee or something like that, unless you're drinking like five, six, ten cups a day. But uh, it's very easy to overdose caffeine if you're relying on pre-workouts or energy drinks or something like that. And a lot of the pre-workouts on the market, in my opinion, are too high in caffeine. They might have 200 milligrams of caffeine per serving, which is the equivalent of like two to three cups of uh, coffee. And, uh, you know, there's genetic differences between people and how they metabolize caffeine. If you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine, then, uh, you know, you could drink coffee and fall asleep fine. And you don't really see adverse effects on heart health because of that, because you clear the caffeine quite fast. If you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, then these people... Uh, appear to get all the negative side effects from caffeine. They get insomnia, they get uh, anxiety, they get uh, irregular heartbeat, those kind of things. So uh, yeah, if you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, then you would definitely want to be very careful with caffeine intake and um, lean more towards the lower intake of caffeine, like less than 200 milligrams, ideally like 100 milligrams. If you're a fast metabolizer, then 400 milligrams, in my opinion, is already too high, like although that's considered like a safe dose per day, but uh, e f for my own preference, uh, I tend to stick somewhere yeah, like 100, 150 milligrams of caffeine uh, per day, which is uh, like a pretty low dose, like one to two cups of uh, coffee is is what you'll uh, is where you can get it uh, from. So yeah, caffeine in very large doses obviously can be lethal. Like if you just take powdered caffeine, <laughs> then many people have a diet to that. It's very easy to overdose on powdered caffeine and uh, yeah, it can also be harmful to for your heart health if it increases your heart rate uh, too much if you take like 400, 500, 600 milligrams of uh, caffeine. And lastly, there are certain supplements that can also interfere with medications like blood thinners and certain um, lipid lowering drugs. You know, if you take something like a garlic supplement or arginine, for example, they can have like negative adverse reactions with these blood thinners like aspirin or something else like that. So uh, yeah, you want to be mindful of that as well, kind of read the the package and uh, make sure that it doesn't interact with uh, certain of the supplements that you uh, might take. Next question, do you think we will see people live to more than 125 in this generation? So it depends a lot on what you mean by this generation. Do you mean that the generation that is born right now? Or do you mean that, okay, is someone right now currently in this generation going to exceed the age of 125. So currently the oldest living person right now is 116 years of age and uh, she's a woman from Japan. So that gives you nine more years to reach the 125 uh, mark. So I think it's, and depends on, yeah, like where do you draw the line? Okay, when does the next generation begin? So I'll, I'll say that I don't think it's feasible that someone right now will exceed over the age of 125 because we haven't made any real breakthroughs in uh, life extension or uh, life expectancy for many decades. And the oldest living person ever in history, John Calment, she made it to 122. The second longest living person was a Japanese woman. She lived to 119. So there was already a three-year gap between those people and no one has ever reached over 125 so far. 
Uh, so and there's nine years for the current older living person to reach 125. So it's too big of a leap. We would see someone already having broken the 120 uh, year mark uh, after John. So yeah, currently I would say we won't be seeing anyone living to 125 or above for the next, I would say, for a few decades at least. <laughs> Uh, and uh, when we're speaking of people who are born right now, so people who are, you know, somewhere in their teenage years, maybe in their early 20s, then uh, it is feasible that those people will um, make it to over 120 and possibly up to 125. So uh, the mathematical mod models, Bayesian models, uh, they have kind of predicted that someone will break John Coleman's uh, record in this century. So before the year 2100, someone will have reached the age of like 130. So I think that is uh, possible uh, because of just improvements in healthcare, people staying healthier for longer, advancements in some like basic medicines that reduce the risk of these chronic diseases. So uh, even just by that, it's possible to reach 130 uh, within this century. But uh, beyond that, you know, we don't have any Currently, we don't have any like massive breakthroughs in <laughs> life extension or longevity. Like we, you know, gene therapy is very new. Currently, there's no evidence that it's going to really do anything. Um, and uh, like regeneration, re regenerative therapies, etc. They're also very new. There's not a lot of evidence that they would extend maximum lifespan. They would probably extend health span so people live like in better health for slightly longer. But uh, yeah, we don't have any like massive breakthroughs that actually mean we're going to live 150, 200 years of age, unfortunately. But uh, for sure, someone will reach 130 within this century based on just the current like improvements in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Next question, how do you feel about the protein powder additive maltodextrin? Some protein powders have up to 15 grams of carbs for maltodextrin. So I'm not a big fan of maltodextrin myself. I think it's kind of unnecessary. You know, my favorite protein powder would be just just a protein powder with minimal additives. Like you don't need the maltodextrin and a lot of these mass gainers they're just essentially pure sugar added to their like maltodextrin or dextrose, whatever it is. So these mass gainers are kind of a scam. <laughs> you could just uh, take a regular clean um, protein powder that just has uh, the protein. And uh, when you're looking at the macros, what I like to look at is that, okay, one scoop of protein powder, it should have, you know, anything somewhere like at least 25 to 30 grams of protein per scoop less than five grams of fat and uh, usually it's kind of something like two grams of carbs from uh, the powder so if it's like whey powder or something like that it's going to contain a little bit of uh, carbohydrates so that's the like ideal protein powder that you would want to look at if it has like 15 grams of uh, carbs in there then it's just added there for like no particular uh, reason next question what are the thoughts on hyaluronic acid supplementation fueling cancer growth so this is a common question i get asked when i ever mention hyaluronic acid so the idea that hyaluronic acid would promote cancer is not really backed up even by animal studies because there are ha having uh, studies on mice that already have cancer that uh, hyaluronic acid supplementation doesn't promote their cancer more or it doesn't increase cancer so uh, yeah i mean there's no real reason to think that hyaluronic acid would let's say promote cancer especially if you don't even have cancer so because the mice who already had cancer they didn't see increase in cancer from hyaluronic acid so it's a lot of this like mechanistic evidence that okay hyaluronic acid is found to be expressed by cancer cells but you know cancer cells 
they express a lot of things and certain pathways are involved in cancer, not because they promote the cancer, but because cancer uses the body to survive. So it just hijacks certain resources or certain pathways to its own benefit. So like, you know, different examples would be autophagy. In certain, ex in certain cases, autophagy expression promotes cancer. In other cases, it reduces and prevents against it. So uh, yeah, you would have to actually have more like, you know, ex experimental studies on animals to kind of uh, prove that hyaluronic acid supplementation would promote cancer. But uh, like I said, the, the studies on mice who already have cancer haven't uh, shown that. Next question, creatine versus cardio. I personally weigh around two kilograms more with creatine and it makes cardio and training for VO2 max more difficult. Would you still recommend it all year round? So yes, uh, there have been meta-analyses showing that creatine supplementation reduces VO2 max slightly and it makes sense because if you're heavier, even though it might be lean tissue, it's going to be harder for you to, you know, produce more or like have a higher VO2 max. So uh, your cardio will be worse if you're heavier, even if it's muscle. So that's why, you know, none of the marathon runners, they don't have a ton of muscle. They want to minimize the weight so that they would run faster and they would have a greater endurance. So with that being said, you know, creatine has its own benefits for muscle growth, for the brain, etc. So what I like to think about is, okay, you know, there are certain periods of the year where I'm focusing more on muscle growth and on some periods of the year, I'm focusing more on VO2 max, etc. So on the periods that I'm focusing more on VO2 max, uh, then uh, I'm just going to stop taking creatine and I'll uh, take the creatine only when I'm in the strength training phase because that's what creatine is most effective for, you know, creatine is not going to be very useful for VO2 max and it actually <laughs> has negative effects on VO2 max. So, you know, you, you don't want to take it when you're deliberately trying to increase your VO2 max. Next question, other than fiber, what is the most potent supplement for lowering cholesterol? So yes, fiber supplementation and fiber intake is something that will lower cholesterol levels, uh, almost like in a dose specific manner that the higher the fiber intake, then the lower the cholesterol will be, of course, to a certain limit. But uh, are there any supplements that do that? There are a few of them that come to mind. First one is berberine. Berberine has clinical trials showing that it has uh, like lipid lowering effects. It of course lowers blood sugar as well, but the blood sugar lowering effects aren't that great compared to something like metformin. But uh, when it comes to lipids, then uh, berberine does work quite well. The second supplement that comes to mind is garlic, whether that be aged garlic extract, something like that, or allicin, etc. Uh, garlic also appears to lower cholesterol and uh, lipids. Garlic also lowers blood pressure and uh, blood sugar levels, but uh, lipids or cholesterol is, is where it's at with a garlic more. Next question, what's the best way to lose visceral fat? I've been losing weight and gaining muscle for a year, but the Tanita weight machine says my visceral fat never falls below 12. I'm not familiar with the specific uh, Tanita machine, and I don't know, like, how do they measure your visceral fat? The best way to measure visceral fat is either with an MRI or the DEXA scan. And a lot of the scales, you know, I'm not really uh, confident in uh, just like regular scales where you step on and then tells you a body fat percentage. I think it it's a bit um, not as accurate, obviously, as a DEXA scan or an MRI. But uh, let's say you have been losing weight and you've been gaining muscle, but your visceral fat is still the same. So what I, if you if you watched my video in a few that I made a few weeks ago, where I talked about the specific things I did to reduce my visceral fat, then the highlights, you know, besides just regular weight loss and not eating sugar and not eating processed foods, then um, the biggest things that I think uh, matter for me were things like green tea intake, reduction in methionine and increase in glycine and doing more cardiovascular exercise. So I didn't change almost like anything else. These were the three biggest things that uh, I changed. So first, green tea, there's evidence that combining green tea with exercise results in greater fat and visceral fat loss than just exercise alone. So uh, it kind of specifically can target visceral fat with that. And I drank two to three cups of green tea per day at that, at that time. Secondly, uh, methionine, excess methionine is known to increase visceral fat as well and uh, to low glycine levels. So uh, low glycine, high methionine, it can also raise homocysteine, but it can also increase uh, visceral fat. So uh, what I did, I drastically reduced my methionine intake. So that would be 
eggs, meat, uh, muscle meat uh, specifically, and dairy. I did consume dairy, so but the thing, biggest things I decreased was like muscle meat. Probably I still consumed some eggs. So yeah, reduction in muscle meat and increase in glycine. So I consumed more collagenous proteins, and I supplemented with you know 10 to 15 grams of glycine every day. So uh, low glycine levels increases visceral fat. So and um, I think this could be one of the biggest like missing links in most people because you know <laughs> most people are eating muscle meat and they're not eating any collagenous meats and they're probably not taking glycine or they're not taking large enough doses of uh, glycine so try to take like 10 grams reduce maybe the muscle meat consumption and uh, th that will bring the methionine down and increase the collagenous proteins so uh, yeah these bone broth uh, tendons and uh, ligaments etc next question which of the four horsemen of death do you worry about most as you get older cancer heart disease dementia or metabolic diseases so the four main killers they would be yeah like heart disease cancer metabolic diseases like diabetes and uh, neurodegenerative conditions like alzheimer's what am i most afraid of probably like cancer because you know i've shared it on my channel before that my grandfather had died to colorectal cancer when he was 36 so that's six years older than me right now <laughs> so um, you know of course i'm much healthier than he was i don't smoke i don't drink alcohol but uh, still like you know there's some like a genetic risk uh, there like i don't have a ton of like longevity genes in my family or like not not a lot of people live long in my family history actually no one has lived over 80 in my in my family uh, tree so far not at least not to my knowledge so uh, i think cancer is probably one of the biggest ones and cancer is also the hardest to solve like we don't really have a definite cause for cancer there's you know different theories but none of them have been like and there's different types of cancer like there's dozens of different types of cancer <laughs> so you would have to uh we don't def we definitely don't know how to prevent all of them or what is the cause of all of them you know besides just stay healthy eat a relatively good diet stay physically active uh, prevent nutrient deficiencies those kind of things and avoid environmental exposures I'm, a, I'm afraid that cancer will eventually become the leading cause of death in the world definitely by the end of this century uh, because there's so many of these environmental toxins heavy metals pollutants microplastics etc that uh, you know we're all exposed to more and more <laughs> uh, whereas heart disease has already peaked the the depth from heart disease has been decreasing already for the last few decades and we have a pretty good understanding about heart disease we know how to prevent it we know how to kind of uh, prevent it from progressing further with uh, certain medications and the lifestyle changes and the same with diabetes like diabetes is also relatively e especially type 2 diabetes you know type 1 diabetes is hard but uh, type 2 diabetes which is mostly caused by lifestyle uh, that is also like easy to prevent and easy to um, treat so uh, cancer is for sure the most mysterious of these horsemen and uh, the most uh, potentially harmful as well because if you get it then it's going to be much harder to cure compared to diabetes or even uh, heart disease for that matter and lastly neurodegeneration so uh, yeah, with the neurodegeneration, yeah, we don't have a cure for it either. And uh, it's also somewhat of a mystery, although it's less mysterious than cancer. <laughs> so uh, from a severity, then cancer is the most lethal or most mysterious than m might be neurodegeneration, then heart disease and then metabolic diseases. Uh, so that would be my like my ranking. What do I do to prevent it? So like I said, we don't have, okay, a specific understanding of this is exactly what is causing cancer so and even then if you look at one thing there might be some other environmental factor that secretly increases the risk so with cancer you just need to do the best you can with your lifestyle uh, you know maintain a normal weight exercise regularly sleep enough uh, eat a good diet uh, try to avoid ultra processed foods especially like this uh, high calorie high sugar high fat uh, kind of ultra processed foods and uh, try to minimize environmental toxins so air pollution heavy metals uh, and those kind of things of course you, if you're in a big city you can't do a lot for air pollution but uh, you know there's certain things you can still do like i think sauna is pretty useful for um, helping to eliminate some of these uh, let's say environmental toxins like heavy metals 
uh, and uh, even microplastics or these xenoestrogens you can sweat out but uh, yeah you need to do your best <laughs> as best uh, you can with these things and you know hopefully in a few decades we will have more effective treatments for Alzheimer's and uh, cancer as well which I'm hopeful that we will have you know in 10 20 30 years we will probably have uh, some uh, more effective uh, treatments for these conditions next question how useful is stretching after a workout or the next day so stretching yeah i'm not a big fan of like regular static stretching which uh, involves you know before a workout you do like this chest stretch or you touch your toes or you do the stretch your knees or something like that but but uh, there is interesting uh, evidence or research that uh, this weighted stretching actually can promote muscle hypertrophy so if you do uh you know for you know this kind of pullover exercise where you do the dumbbell pullover over your head that's like a weighted stretch your body's kind of in a stretched position it's under weight so this tension causes uh mechanical tension and uh, metabolic stress that can promote muscle hypertrophy so if you're really like trying to maximize muscle hypertrophy there are a few exercises that you can add that have a weighted stretch component like i said the pullover is one of them the lat pull down can be one of them as well especially if you do it in a slightly this arced position where you're like pulling down like here to your knees this uh this is good good stretch for the lats um i remember a few years ago when i was <laughs> more focused on muscle hypertrophy than what i did was i did some sort of a heavy lat pull down exercise so like five reps of some lat pull down exercise or a weighted pull up and then what i would do immediately after that is you know find a pole put my hands like this and then kind of try to stretch the lats somehow like i don't know how to show it but you know you're trying to stretch the lats and you can feel it for sure after a heavy set you will feel it and uh, you can feel the stretch now you don't want to overdo it get a like a cramp or something like that <laughs> that could be also a realistic thing but yeah you will feel the stretch and this uh, stretch apparently has like minor effects on muscle hypertrophy it's not going to be you know obviously super significant but uh, this way that stretching does uh, work to a certain extent and um, stretching on rest days mostly can help with muscle soreness and yes even this static stretching after a heavy workout it can also promote like minor hypertrophy because of the same idea so you have a heavy workout to the next day you feel sore you want to alleviate the soreness you can do the, whatever the chest stretch or the stretch your uh, glutes or um, hamstrings etc you will you know reduce the muscle soreness but you can also have some minor benefits on muscle hypertrophy uh, with that so uh, this is what i would do like add some weighted stretch component after a heavy set is where i find it most most effective next question protein restriction increased lifespan like calorie restriction so this is one of the oldest questions in <laughs> in longevity science uh, is protein restriction going to extend lifespan or is it harmful or is calorie restriction is it intermittent fasting etc well it does appear that calorie restriction is the most reproducible uh, non-genetic method to extend lifespan in animals so uh, there's you know for decades there have been different studies showing that and it has also produced the most profound extension in life lifespan so uh, it's been like 65 percent extension in uh, mice uh, or mouse uh, lifespan when it comes to protein restriction then it's there is also some uh, studies that find that but with uh, protein restriction it's somewhat more complicated uh, calorie restriction appears to be more responsible for the life extension effects in uh, from protein restriction so if you compare head to head then calorie restriction appears to be superior to protein restriction and with protein restriction it looks like the main thing responsible for the life extension is the reduction in methionine and uh, methionine whether or not it's bad for longevity also depends a lot on the glycine status so there's been a few studies that uh, look at that uh, that show that methionine isn't going to shorten lifespan if uh, the rats are given glycine or supplemental glycine so the kind of methionine glycine balance that i mentioned earlier it can affect homocysteine levels you can affect different aspects of the metabolism so uh, 
yeah, if you're worried about protein shortening lifespan based on animal studies, then you would want to just increase your glycine intake to balance the methionine. But when you look at the actual human uh, studies, longitudinal studies, then uh, protein restriction is actually associated with higher mortality, especially in the elderly, elderly people, because elderly people who reduce their protein intake or have a low protein diet, they tend to be at a higher risk of frailty and sarcopenia and you know, dying to uh, fractures. So there is a trade-off that you don't want to <laughs> make, especially when you're older. When you're young, we don't have any data that, okay, if you've been eating a high-protein diet since you were 20, how is it going to affect your maximum lifespan or your risk of cancer when you're 65? We don't have like any data about that, uh, any like real data. A low protein diet when you're older than 65 certainly will is associated with a higher risk of uh, death because of the malnutrition and frailty aspect. So I don't think that it's worthwhile to restrict protein. And of course, we're talking about how much you you, you would restrict it. So uh, the optimal amount of protein for muscle growth is 0 0.8 grams per pound or 1.6 grams per kilogram. And if you consume more than that, then you don't see additional benefits for muscle growth. Uh, based on randomized controlled trials. So um, I would say that there's no need to eat more than that anyway. <laughs> so, But if you stick to the 0 0.8 grams per pound, then um, that maximizes muscle hypertrophy. Whether or not it's bad for longevity over the long term, we don't know. I find it hard to believe that it would be granted that you're not becoming overweight and you're not... Um, wrecking your kidneys or something so you need to mark you need to look at your biomarkers as well okay how is your kidney health etc so uh, kidney disease typically like it becomes wor or kidney function typically worsens with age but uh, and there's no like uh, worry that in otherwise healthy people a high protein diet would increase the risk of kidney disease it only does so in people with already compromised uh, kidneys but again you know do you want to take the risk and how much protein do you need to build muscle? So it uh, depends on your goals. So like how much protein do you want to, how much muscle do you want to build and how much protein do you need for that? Next question, how would you do cardio and build strength if you were limited by joint pain? So joint pain is, yeah, like a tricky situation. You definitely don't want to exercise through the pain or anything like that. If you have any joint issues or like nagging injuries, then uh, you definitely shouldn't like uh, irritate that joint. So if you have elbow pain, then uh, kind of you need to take a time off from exercising that specific joint, or at least that in that way. So there are ways to work around it. So for example, I've had in the past some uh, elbow pain, I fixed it. And during that time, I still did this like slow repetition lightweight um, and high amounts of reps for that elbow. So I did like these regular um, resistance bands curls for like 50 reps, etc. with this lightweight and that kind of promotes blood flow to the area and helps with uh, healing and recovery. But if I were to do heavy pull-ups, you know, it would <laughs> reset uh, the progress and be more harmful. So you need to take time off uh, from irritating the joint, but slight light movements can be beneficial. So like this physiotherapy can be beneficial. But um, you can also do like different exercises for that. So many people might find that, okay, if I do curls like this, then it irritates, irritates my elbow. But if I turn it around, I do the opposite way, then it doesn't. So there are ways to work around different uh, injuries as well. Uh, but you would always want to kind of proactively try to uh, rehab the, the joint that might have some pain. When it comes to cardio, then okay, you know, you might have knee pain, you can you can do cycling, you can do swimming. So uh, with cardio, it's pretty easy. You don't need to do running, you don't need to do any like burpees or something like that. You can do uh, whatever cardio that you like. And you can work around that. With uh, certain strength exercises, you know, you have back pain, you can't do deadlifts, then you shouldn't do deadlifts at that moment, you can find some alternative exercise, you can do some like the I guess it's called cable uh, rows, for example, and uh, some even like barbell rows or something like that. Uh, you can always work around different kinds of uh, exercises. So you, there's no 
uh, there's no need to do specifically deadlifts or specifically bench press or specifically overhead press. There are many variations in these exercises. You can use machines, you can use dumbbells, you can use barbells, you can use resistance bands, you can use a body weight. Like, yeah, there's, you know, hundreds of exercises <laughs> that you can choose uh, to do around that. But uh, actively doing the rehab, actively doing some of these, uh, let's say, lighter reps and directing blood flow to the region can be also beneficial to, like, you know, help to treat uh, that injury. If it's like a very long-term injury, then, of course, consulting with some professional uh, can be a faster way to uh, find the root cause of the injury. Sometimes these injuries come from poor form, you're doing the exercise wrong, uh, or with two heavyweights, which then just leads to the injury. Uh, but uh, yeah, there it is. Next question, how much NAC per day? Woman 60 plus for longevity. So NAC is one of those supplements that uh, has several clinical trials over the last few years combined with glycine that it shows uh, benefits in you know, you could say yeah, anti-aging or longevity, but what it does is mostly it like affects mitochondrial function, inflammation, uh, grip strength, walking speed, and uh, body composition, those kind of things. And uh, the doses typically used in those studies are over 2.5 grams of NAC and glycine both. And the age group was uh, 75 plus uh, years of age. So if you're 60 and above, then uh, you could already benefit from a slightly har har um, you would already benefit from a slightly larger dose of NAC. So uh, 2.5 grams is the, like the minimal dose that I find to be effective. Um, you might you could maybe benefit from slightly less if you're in your 60s compared to when you're 75. It's hard to tell, uh, but uh, you know again measuring your biomarkers is something that also matters. Like if you see that your inflammation markers, for example which is the only like real thing you can measure here from the blood, uh, that it goes down after taking NSE, then it you know, appears to work. You can also, yeah, measure it with your grip strength, your walking speed, etc. Uh, based on the clinical trials, those things would improve. If it doesn't, then you might need like a larger dose because they even use doses of up to 7.2 grams, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, is a pretty large amount of NSE and glycine, but um, I think it's worthwhile to try it out at least. Next question, any advice on promoting stimulating appetite? One easy way to stimulate appetite is to just eat hyperpalatable meals. <laughs> so, uh, you know, of course, uh, ultra processed foods are hyperpalatable, they're engineered to be hyperpalatable. I'm not saying that it's the best way to consume calories or stimulate appetite. It's just, it kind of highlights the idea that there are certain food combinations that are very hyperpalatable. So uh, these processed foods typically have a specific uh, ratio of salt, sugar, and fat that is like hyper palatable. So they're kind of savory, their, uh, you know, crunchiness is appetizing, there's certain colors that are more appetizing, there are certain textures that are more appetizing. And, uh, you know, it can also be individual, some people might find crunchier food more appetizing, some other people find more like gelatinous foods are more appetizing, so whatever it is. Uh, but the key here is usually like, higher fat or higher carbohydrate content because protein is super satiating and the fiber is also very satiating <laughs> so if you're very very full with your meals and you're you don't have any appetite then you know chances are that um, you might be consuming um, adequate amounts of protein and fiber already and uh, just increasing the carbohydrate or fat content can be one way to increase uh, the appetite but uh the interesting thing here is that there's also what's called like palate uh, fatigue. So if you eat just the same type of food, eventually you will be satiated by that. So if you eat, let's say, one specific type of food, even if it's, let's say, chips, uh, potato chips, you eat, you eat, eventually you'll become um, like satiated. From there, you, be, you develop this palate fatigue. Like, oh, I don't want to eat any more of these chips because I've had too much already. But if you change it up, you eat chip, chip, chips, then you eat ice cream, then it kind of resets <laughs> your uh, uh, appetite or your satiety. Like, oh, I can still eat ice cream because it's a new flavor. You haven't experienced palate fatigue with this type of food. You eat ice cream, then you might even go back to the chips. Like it kind of <laughs> resets your appetite. And uh, that's why a lot of different types of foods 
can uh, result in um, overconsumption. So, but if you eat just the single type of food, you know, you eat just steak that is very satiating, you develop palate fatigue much faster. But if you eat, if you eat just steak, then you have ice cream, then you can keep it ice, eat, keep eating ice cream. You know, there's a reason. It's there's a saying that uh, there's always room for dessert, which is literally true because if you eat a main course dinner like steak and potatoes and vegetables, you eat it, oh, you're full. Then someone brings out ice cream or some dessert. <laughs> then it kind of resets. You're able to eat it. So that's just how uh, the human mind, or yeah, our our, our like appetite has uh, developed. And uh, palate fatigue is one way you can overcome or increase appetite. You just switch it up. You know, you can switch it up with health foods as well. You have steak and potatoes. Then you have uh, some additional foods uh, that are different type. You know, some, some some soup or something like that. Some fruits that are, can stimulate appetite. So yeah, just switching it up is one of the easiest ways to increase uh, appetite and uh, avoid this uh, palate fatigue. And the last question is, what's a good VO2 max for women? That depends a lot on uh, their age. So the older you get, the lower your VO2 max typically is. VO2 max peaks when you're 18 years old in the general population. And uh, of course, you can have a higher VO2 max in your 30s when compared to when you were 18, which is is the case for me. My VO2 max is significantly higher right now when I'm 30 compared to when I was 18 and in high school. Women typically have slightly lower VO2 max, something like 10 to 15 percent uh, lower than men. And uh, when you look at the uh, the uh, longitudinal studies, then people who have a VO2 max of 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute have a significantly lower risk of all-cause mortality compared to people, you know, even compared to people who have 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute, not to mention people who have 20 milliliters per kilogram uh, per minute. So uh, as a woman, if, you, if you're in your 20s or 30s, then it's easy and it's possible to achieve a VO2 max of 50, relatively easy. Even in your 40s, you could uh, do it if you're more athletic. Um, what is a good DL? What's a good VO2 max? It depends a lot on your age. If you're 80 years old, then a VO2 max of 30 is excellent. <laughs> but a VO2 max of 30 when you're 20 is is quite bad. So uh, there's a huge age age factor here. So I would say that okay, in your 20s and 30s, an excellent VO2 max is somewhere in your 50s. A good VO2 max is is like 45 plus 45 to 48, 49. If you're over 40 years of age, then a good VO2 max is low 50s, like 51, 52. And excellent is like 55 still, you can do it. Uh, but yeah, in your 60s and uh, 70s and 80s, a good VO2 max is yeah, somewhere around 40, 41, 42. If it's you know 20, then uh, that's very close to the frailty threshold or the disability line. If your VO2 max is below 17.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute, then you're not going to be able to take care of yourself physically because you just lack the fitness. You're not able to carry groceries. You're not able to even put on clothes and uh, do like house chores. So yeah, our goal as we get older is to avoid <laughs> the disability line for as long as possible. You know, if you're 100 years old, then chances are you will be below the disability line unless you are super fit and, un and unless you're doing a lot of... Uh, health activities into your 100 years of age. Uh, but yeah, how high should it be depends a lot on your age. The younger you are, the higher it should be generally. All right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.